does the word critic mean to you, and is it different than critical or criticism? So the popular notion of critic is that you are standing in judgment. You're coming up with a set of hierarchies for looking at things that this is a five and that's a four and I'll give this one a two. There's a kind of commercial notion of criticism. You know, do I want to see that film or is this restaurant worth my money? I don't really think of what I do that way. I mean, I, I am making judgment, but mainly what I think criticism is, it's, it's thinking in public. When you come to a space like this and you see paintings, what are you looking for? What is your first thing to do? The first thing I do when I confront something like this is to describe it. And a lot of criticism is actually description. It's a kind of thick description. Just looking really close. I mean, if we look at these, these paintings, you immediately have a set of questions. Questions like, what am I looking at? Are they white shapes and black lines or black shapes with white lines? Why are some messy? Why is there just one painting with color? And what do they mean? These are not paintings of something. I can't spend a lot of time saying, that really does look like a dog, or that's not a particularly good horse in the background, or I think the light is wrong. And so description becomes really the, the, the main tool in the kit that you're using as a journalist. So this is one of the great works from the middle of the last century. It's Barnett Newman's uh, Stations of the Cross. Now, if you know uh, Catholic theology, you hear the term Stations of the Cross, and you think, ah, this is a religious painting in some way. I'm picturing something very different than this. You're picturing something very different, something very representational, because there's this long history of painting these, these very excruciating moments in the last hours of Christ's life, from his condemnation to death to his crucifixion. What he seems to want you to do is to take away from it some larger message some more fundamental question. And as a critic, the question I think he's asking is very close to one that we ask in, in, in the work we do. It's not what does this mean, it's more is meaning possible? Is it, is it possible to make paintings in the middle of the 20th century after these wars, after these horrible catastrophes that have any meaning at all? And so he references Christ's words from the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me in the title of the painting? And for me, in a sense, that, that brings us back to the most fundamental thing. Why do we keep thinking about art? Why do we keep making art? What drives us forward in an age when really there's so many more pressing and horrible things and there's so many reasons really to despair of the world. Do you sometimes question your own role as a critic in that same context? I mean, you're surrounded by colleagues who are breaking major news stories or reporting on, you know, reporting from war zones around the world. You're writing about art. All the time, yeah. And and does that matter? Is it is it just a, is it a secondary thing that we can dispense with? A lot of people say yes to that. So one of the things critics are doing almost all the time, if you're writing about art, if you're writing about classical music, if you're writing about theater, part of what you're doing is just making the argument, this matters, this is relevant too. Do you worry about this field dying out? Yes, I do. It's a very odd thing um, to go alone into a museum and spend time looking at a very quiet, silent thing hanging on the wall. Everything in our lives these days is tending towards a much faster sense of processing information, a much more fractured sense of consciousness. This takes work. And it's hard to say to people today, you need to work to like something. That goes against what we're supposed to, how we think about culture mostly. It doesn't seem democratic. It seems elitist to say, this takes effort. You may not like it at first, but trust me, you will like it later. So how is the field changing? We can all be critics now, because there are so many social media platforms, everyone can have a voice. Well, you know, I, when we say everybody's a critic, it can mean a lot of different things. The best sense of it is that everybody goes out and they do something like what critics do. They look at, they think, they learn, they refine their feelings about something. And so that's, that's the good part of it. There are a lot of places to look at art where the person writing about it may not be removed enough from the institution that's presenting it or the artists who are making it. They might be friends with the artist they might be or friends. Might be on the payroll of the institution. Right, they may be putting things on their Instagram and taking money to do it. So kind of, you know, caveat emptor when you're reading um, people who are writing about art. So um, buyer beware. Buyer beware. Who are they and why are they, why are they doing it and how independent are they? And do they speak to you? Kennecott got his start writing about classical music, but he switched to art and won the Pulitzer Prize for his coverage in 2013. The Post hired a second Pulitzer-winning art critic in 2016, adding Sebastian Smee's byline to the paper, 
even as the field of art criticism struggled to survive. It's hard because, you know, newspapers have gone through a lot of crisis recently and they've cut their critics. That's, that's one of the first places when, when times get uh, lean, it tends to be the, the arts critics that, that are among the first on the chopping block. So you have to really, really want to do this, to go into the profession. It's, it's not going to be an easy path. Mainly, I think, you need to develop a kind of insatiable curiosity about the field that you're going to criticize and the desire to write and just do it. And maybe that means doing it for yourself. Maybe that means doing it on your own personal web page or Facebook entries until you feel the confidence to go out and offer your services to people who will pay to do it. When you first saw these paintings, did you like them? You know, I remember seeing them. They were in a different space and I did like them. And, and I'm so curious about what that even means, right? To like something. I, I remember walking into a room, and often this is the first impression you have of a work, and that is just a sense, ah, something's happening here. You know, I may not, I may not know it yet. It may take me a while to figure out what's going on, but you know, lined up against a, a, a number of other works that you may just pass by and think, hmm, okay, maybe I should, I should give that more time. I'll come back. I'll thinking about it. There is, in some ways, a kind of intuition that there's an event that this is going to be something you're going to spend time with. And I remember thinking that instantly upon seeing these works. Like, wow, this is completely different, and they add up to something, and this is not a one hour or a one minute or a one day um, engagement. So there's only one painting in here that has color in it? Right. And what does that mean? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea. So when you get there, you're thinking, what is that? Something, somehow everything has changed. Is that, is that a moment of transcendence? If this is a, a cycle leading through these painful things of, of Christ's last hours, does that somehow represent what comes after or what comes before? I don't know. You know, ultimately with abstract art, there is this question that maybe the act of interpretation itself is somehow misguided, that you're really supposed to sort of just exist with the work. Maybe this is, maybe this is meaningless, you know? That's sort of what I think Barnett is, Barnett is confronting, and it's what all critics, I think, have to confront if they're honest about what they do.